It is the day the Lord has made. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, happy Wednesday to you. Can you do me a favor once you have hit this live? Can you invite somebody to worship along with us? Can you do me that favor? Invite somebody to worship along with us as we worship through the study of God's word. And I am excited and grateful to have the opportunity to come and worship with you today through the study of God's word. It is so important that every opportunity that we get to study God's word together, that we ought to do that. Um, in the times in which we live, if we don't have anything else, we have the unadulterated word of God. And that is the only thing that is going to sustain us. That's the only thing that is going to keep us. Um, but most of all, um, his word gives us life and it gives us light. And so come on in here and uh, worship with us uh, today. Now, uh, I don't know if you saw earlier, I posted that I was going to have a special guest. Um, but some things happen and, you know, it's all good. We're going to make it uh, do what it do. And we're going to just enjoy the Lord uh, through the study of his word. Well, if you've been following us, we are in the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew. So I want you to get that before we get ready to get into the word of the Lord. The 15th chapter of the book of Matthew. I want you to go ahead and grab that as we get ready to get into God's uh, holy, holy and righteous word. Uh, make sure you grab a Bible. Make sure you grab uh, a pen and paper um, because we want to make sure that um, we are constantly dialoguing and learning in the word of the Lord. All right. So make sure you grab uh, your pen, your paper and your Bible. Everybody on YouTube. Good morning. I don't know why my video was a little ugly this morning, but that's all right. We're going to we're going to keep going. Um, if you know something about me, y'all, I am very um, when it comes to technical stuff. I like stuff to be the way I want it. But hey, nevertheless, we're going to we're going to get into God's word. Uh, amen. Together. If you're over there in Facebook, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can y'all hit that share button? If you hadn't hit it, I want you to hit it as we get ready to get in prayer. As we get ready to go in prayer and get our lesson started for amen to Day. And so I want you to make sure you are uh, ready to study with us and make sure you are ready, most of all, to pray with us. All right, let's let's pray. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you for the blessed privilege of life. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength. We thank you for allowing us to come and study your holy word together. I pray today, Lord, that you will speak to us through your word, that it may grow up in us, that it may mature in us. God, most of all, God, that we may hide your word in our hearts, that when we need it, the Holy Spirit will bring it back to our remembrance, but most of all, that we may not be able to sin against you. God, I pray today as bread of heaven, feed us until we want no more. We thank you for it in the name of him who said, if I and I be lifted up from this world, I'll draw men unto me. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. We're in the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew. I believe it's going to be a very interesting dialogue today. I also believe it's going to challenge um, some people thinking. Now, I'm going to say this at the beginning of this lesson today. Um, to understand the pureness of this text. Um, it's going to be some kind of cynical um, dialogue in this text, some cynical behavior in this text. And I, I want to say that from the onset because um, some people think, and, and some people are, um, that they take the word of God to throw slams. Well, this is not taking the word of God to throw slams. This is to make sure 
that we understand the pureness of this text. And so this text is a little, um, little petty, I guess, which is what it's, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting, the dialogue that the Lord has. And, um, and let's get into it. I just want to say it before we get into it because I don't want people to think I'm taking an occasion to, to take a stab at anybody. Uh, if, if you know me, uh, I, don't, I don't have a problem saying whatever I need to say to anybody. Uh, but when you read this text today, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. And then we're going to challenge each other in our thinking. Y'all ready? All right, let's get into it. Matthew, the 15th chapter, starting at verse number one. Then came Jesus, uh, then came to Jesus, excuse me, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother. He that curseth thy father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift. By whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother. He shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. Ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah, Isaiah prophesy of you saying. Let's, let's stop. And I, I want to go ahead and I said, take this of the pureness of the text. That's all I can say. Jesus now has found himself encountering the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, for the last several weeks, as we studied the 12th, 13th, 14th, and now the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew, the scribes and the Pharisees, they are following Jesus. They are around Jesus because what they are trying to do is trying to trip, you know, trip him up, trying to get him to break the law, trying to get him to break the word. When they realize they could not combat him with the word, now they come at him at tradition. Now, here's what we're going to have to pay some close attention because even in the Bible days and even now, people think tra uh, tradition trump the word of God. Are y'all with me? Even now, even in the church, you have people who will be more loyal to a tradition than they are the word of God. And when you call them on it, they, they still want to follow tradition more than they follow the word of God. Hear me closely today. God's word comes before and surpasses and overrule everything. So here is what Jesus is dealing with. The Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus and says, why do your disciples break our tradition? Not only our tradition, the tradition of the elders, what was given to us by our forefathers. Why do your disciples break that tradition when they refuse to wash their hands before they eat bread? Why, why do they do that? Why? Re remember, here is the language of the text. I want you to read it and for yourself. Why do they break the traditions of the elders? One thing I want to share with you uh, real briefly is that sometimes our elders did the best that they could. Are y'all with me? Sometimes our elders did the best that they could. It did not mean that everything our elders did was right or lawful. Come on, Facebook and, and YouTube, y'all talk to me. It was good as a good practice. Like right now, it's still a good practice. Before you eat, wash your hands. Before you go into a kitchen like I was raised, wash your hands. 
I don't care if you was in the kitchen and you went to the living room for two seconds. When you come back into the kitchen, I was taught you wash your hands. You wash, excuse me, your hands. That's good practice. But now the scribes and the Pharisees is trying to hold tradition like it is biblical doctrine. And the reality is it's a good practice, but it ain't Bible. Okay? So Jesus says to them, and which is very interesting to me, Jesus says to them, you so worried about breaking the tradition of the elders, but you're breaking and transgressing the commandments of God. Now here's what what Jesus is talking about. He's telling them that you ought to honor your mother and your father. We know that. That's, that's in the book of Exodus. We ought to honor our mother and our father, that our days may be long upon the earth, which the Lord our God has given us. I hope all of you have learned that while you were growing up. We are supposed to honor those who have taken care of us, those that are elders to us, It is our duty. It is our job. It is our requirement. As a matter of fact, let's go to Exodus 20 and 12, and I'm going to read for you um, what the Bible says in Exodus 20 and 12. Here it is. Honor thy father and thy mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gives you. It is God's word. You ought to honor thy mother and thy father. Now, what is Jesus talking about in this text? And I'm, I'm, this may be something you've never seen before, but I want to share this with you real quick. I want you to go to Mark chapter number seven, Mark chapter number seven, um, and verse number 11. There was what they felt like a clause or a statue or practice where they didn't have to take care of their parents. They didn't have to honor their parents. In this text, Jesus is not just talking about honoring their parents, but he's also talking about taking care of their parents because biblically, when your parents got too old, you took care of them. That's, I mean, that's biblically what happened. When they got to the age where they couldn't work and they couldn't no longer fend for themselves, we did it. You did it. I did it. They did it. Okay? Okay? Uh, But the scribes and the Pharisees wanted to find a way around that. And so here is what Jesus is talking about when he says, uh, let me read it again in Matthew and then I'll go to uh, Mark 7 uh, and 11. Here's what Jesus says. Verse number five in in chapter 15 of Matthew. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. Honor thy mother and thy father, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now let's see what they're talking about. Uh, Mark 7 and 11. Mark 7 and 11 says, But if you say, if a man shall say to his father or his mother, it is Corbin, that is to say a gift by whatsoever ye may, might, excuse me, be profited by me, ye shall be free and ye permit him no more to do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through traditions which you have delivered, what you have handed down and many such like things do you. So there was a tradition back in the Bible days where you could say to your parents that the the money or the support that you would give them, you gave that money to the Lord. Okay? Okay. Corbin means it's a gift. It's a gift to God. So you could tell your parents, the support that I was supposed to give you, I gave it to God. Okay? 
That way you were free so they felt like. You were free from taking care of them because you gave it you gave it to God. You, 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 you submitted that gift to the Lord. And so here's what Jesus says. Uh, he says in verse number 12 of, of Mark chapter number 7, you permit him no more to do anything for his father or his mother. Making the word of God of none effect through the tradition which you delivered and many such things like this do you. He says, this is what y'all said. This is what you came up with so you didn't have to be a blessing to your parents. I didn't come up with this. This is not what I have set in order. I set in order that you ought to honor your mother and your father. That you ought to support them. That you ought to take care of them. Let me, let me help you out. If, if your parents are living and you are well financially able to be a blessing to your parents, you ought to do that. If you have a, a parent who's up in age or sickly and you have the ability to take care of them, then you ought to do that. Maybe you feel like the best way I can take care of them is put them in a rehabilitation center, is to put them, I don't like to say old folks home, but to put them in a nursing facility and not just drop them off, but be there with them to help them as much as you can. That is, that's your God-given ability. But what the scribes and the Pharisees wanted to do, they wanted to release themselves of their parents and said, oh, what I was going to give to you, I'm going to give it to God. Jesus turned around and says, through your traditions, through your beliefs, through your hand-me-down rules, what you have done is you have made the word of God in your lives none effect which means the word of God is not activated in your life because you made up in your mind that you were going to do what you wanted to do, how you want to do it, when you want to do it. And the reality is, if you're going to do it God's way, you can't pick and choose what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. And so I, I want to I want to stop first of all to tell you that what's killing many churches in this 21st century is we are so hell bent on tradition that we're not following God's word. It's it's what we do. Watch this. We wear white in the summer, black in the winter for communion. Tradition. Something wrong with it? No. Not, none whatsoever. But when you make it sound like a biblical law, we have a problem. We were in the sanctuary here the other day. As a matter of fact, after our, um, after our uh, service on Sunday, because we could not do the drive-in because it rained. And so... We were talking about, uh, we were joking that we were taking pictures in front of the communion table. And I made the comment, oh, don't touch that table. Because some people will have a heart attack because you've touched the table. Catch this. That's tradition. There was no communion table in the upper room. It wasn't even their room. It was somebody's house. The scripture says, Jesus says, go into a city. There you'll find a man bearing a pitcher of water. Ask him for the guest chamber. There he's going to show you to a large upper room. This platform in which we use to preach the gospel, the pulpit in which we use to preach the gospel. We've made it unto the throne. These buildings, we've made them into mausoleums. When this is just a house that we have worship in. We cannot be so focused on our hand-me-down traditions that the word of God does not mean anything. That's what Jesus told them in Mark chapter number 7, verse number 11 and verse number 12. He said, you can't do this. You cannot think you can make the word of God a null effect because your tradition speaks something different. 
Anything that we do as believers should coincide with the word of God, or we should coincide with the word of God, not the word coinciding with us, because the word is not supposed to fit in our lives. We, ought to, we are supposed to fit our lives into the word of God. Are y'all here with me today? And so in this text, Jesus wanted them to understand that just because you feel like you don't want to take care of your mother and your father, it ain't good enough. But you want to worry about the disciples washing their hands. He said, Isaiah prophesied about y'all. And you know what he called you? Hypocrites. You actor, actors and actresses. Hypocrites mean actor or actress. It means you're putting on a show. You don't mean none of this stuff, but you're putting on a show for people. Now, here's the problem, my brothers and my sisters, and I know some people are going to be mad and they're going to get on the telephone and call folk. Did you hear what he just said? It's the word of God. The only tradition we ought to be following is the tradition of preaching and teaching and living the word of God, fasting and praying. Come on, talk to some, talk to me. Loving one another, supporting one another. What, what, that's, that's the word of God. But all this other stuff, especially if it stands in the way of pure worship, if it stands in the way of you living the life that God wants you to live, get rid of your traditions. The scribes and the Pharisees, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they wanted to bind people by tradition, and they tried to box Jesus in by tradition. Tried to box him in. Oh, your disciples ain't washing their hands. Come on, let's, let's go back to what Jesus is saying. Verse number seven. He said, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah, or Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, the people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You cannot have a strong talk but a weak walk. It's in your Bible. You, you want to honor me with your mouth. Or you want to draw near to me with your mouth and honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. There are some people who can talk a great game. They can talk wonderfully about Christianity. But when you look at the matters of the heart, your heart will tell who you are out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. You cannot have lip service. God wants you to be a lover of him. And if you are a lover of God, you are a lover of his word. I'm not talking about studying his word so you can argue your point with people. That's lip service. You, 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 you just trying to get the letter. And the Bible says that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. There are some people that the only reason they want to study the word of God is because they want to argue with other people about what God's word says, about what God's word does not say. And this is the scripture. And this is the scripture. But if you are that much a lover of his word, then your life ought to be a representation of that what you are trying to study and debate. Scribes and the Pharisees, they knew the law, they knew tradition, but their heart was not with God. He said, you, honor, you draw now with me with your mouth, verse number eight, but your heart and with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And look at verse number nine, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He says, but in vain, they do worship me. Oh, you worship and you, you call in my name, but it means nothing. It symbolizes nothing. Why? Because you're teaching the doctrines and the commandments of men. You're not teaching what I say. You're not teaching what my word declares. And what is interesting to me is people will want to hold on to man-made stuff. 
Build your hopes on things eternal. If it's not eternal, it can vanish away. But God's word will stand forever. Verse number 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which come out of the mouth. This defileth the man. Not what goes in, but what comes out. Now, here's what Jesus is telling them when it came to uh, not washing the hands. This body, I built this body that when whatever they eat, it will go down into their digestive system. It will go into their intestines and the waste of what they ate will come out. That's defilement. Especially if you're trying to be in waste management. <laughs> it is not what goes in them because I built this body to process that kind of stuff. It's only if you go and try to grab the waste. That's waste management. A dog, when he's hungry and there's no food there, he vomits and he goes back and eats is his vomit. The Bible says, as a dog returned to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. In other words, only a dog throws up mess and go back and eat it. What goes in the man defiles him. I mean, does not defile him. It what comes out of the man, especially if he around here dealing with waste management. Watch this. You got some people who major in mess under the umbrella of God's word. And that is not what God teaches. That's, what not, that's not what God is trying to get his children to do and understand. And so we've got to be careful. Verse number 11. Let's do it again. Verse number 11 says, not that which goeth into the mouth defile of the man, but that which come out of the mouth this defileth them. I can take stuff in. Don't mean I got to let it out. You got control of your mouth. Oh, they made me cuss. Stop lying. They didn't make you cuss. You felt like cursing. Come on, let's tell the truth. I can't make you curse. I can do stuff to upset you, but I I don't have the authority to make you respond in a manner that's not like God or in a manner that a Christian ought not do. Come on. I don't have that authority. I don't have that. If you curse somebody out, it's because you wanted to curse them out. So it's not that was in you that messed you up. It's what you let come out of you that messes you up. Facebook, y'all ain't talking. Me and you two having a good time over here. You can intake stuff, but it don't have to come out your mouth. I can watch any movie I feel like watching. Any movie. It doesn't mean I'm going to go back and do what I saw in the movie. Because I knew when it went in to my eye gate and my ear gate, I knew it was just a show. So I'm not going to allow that to come out of me when I knew I got control of what comes out of me. Verse number 12, then came his disciples and said unto him, knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard these sayings? You know, you just made the powers that be mad, Jesus. Verse number 13, but he answered and said, every plant which the, my heavenly father have not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. Jesus simply says, I made them mad. 
I don't care. That's not my concern because their rule will not be eternal. Because every plant that's planted that my daddy didn't plant, I'm going to pluck it up. Every plant. I, I've, if, if you've ever heard me preach over a, a length of time, you've heard me give this statistic. When Jesus was dealing with the Last Supper uh, and doing Passover, he says, I have 12 disciples and one is a devil. So the, the statistic that I give, that any time we come together, one out of 12 people is a devil. And I often tell people, don't start counting, because if you start counting, you just may miss yourself. Okay? Jesus says, when the sons of God got together, Satan is always in the midst. So we understand, that's in the book of Job. So we understand that any time we come together as believers, Satan always shows up. We Always. We just studied this a couple of weeks ago. You have to let the wheat and the tare do what? Grow together. If you notice Jesus, he's staying in the same vein, in the same narrative he's been teaching us for the last couple of chapters. Everybody that's planted that my daddy didn't plant, he's going to uproot them. Let the wheat and the tare grow together, and in the time of the harvest that he gave the parable, I'll do the separating. Ain't that right? And so understand, there are some people you don't have to remove. Leave them alone. God will remove them. God will take care of them because what they are doing is leading the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, they will both fall into a ditch. That's why I tell people anytime I'm preaching, anytime I'm teaching, don't you dare close your Bible. Because I can misquote stuff. Not intentionally misquoting anything, but I can misquote. And so in my, mis in my humanness, that is not what I'm trying to say. In my humanity is what I'm trying to say. I, I, can, I can be off. I, I can miss. Not intentionally, but I can miss. And so you got to make sure that you've seen the word of God for yourself. I, have, I, I remember years ago I was preaching a revi revival at First Jerusalem Baptist Church. That's when their church was um, off of... Um, Montgomery Street, in between Montgomery and, I can't remember the other street that is, but it was off of Montgomery Street, the church with the red door. Um, pastor Bowles was the pastor then, uh, Nathaniel Bowles. Uh, and I remember as a teenage preacher, I was probably, oh God, 17, 18 years old. I did the youth revival for, for several years. Uh, so I started the youth revival probably at 17 uh, and did the revival until no, probably at, at 16, 17, and did their revival until I got uh, 18. Um, yeah, until I got 18. Well, I kept declaring there was a man at the pool of Bethesda. I used to keep saying for 36 years, and unintentionally. And he grabbed me and he said, son, uh, I got people in my church that know that ain't, that ain't the right number. I said, oh, pastor, I'm sorry. It was a misquote. I wasn't trying to mislead nobody. It was a misquote. 45th Street, that's it. 45th Street. And so when you study or hear somebody preaching and teaching the word of God, open up your Bibles or take great notes that you can go back home and later and feast on that word. Because everybody that's preaching ain't preaching for the salvation of souls. That's why in this season, there are some preachers who are struggling because they do not have the platform of Showtime at the Apollo no more. Now this is, let's see how much word you really have so that you can be able to stand in the midst of some hard times because we're definitely living, living in some difficult time. All right, let's get back into the word of God. He said, you got to be careful. They're blind leaders and the blind it's leading a blind, and if the blind lead the blind, guess what's happened? Both of them will fall in the ditch. Now, let's go in uh, verse number 15. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not 
ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceedeth out of the mouth comes from the heart, and they defile man. For out of the heart perceive evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These are the things which defile man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Jesus said, you ain't got it. You mean to tell me you don't understand what goes through your mouth? Jesus really broke it down to you. It goes in your belly, it goes in your intestines, and it comes out the other end. That, it, it can't defile you. What defiles you is what comes out of your mouth. Because what comes out of your mouth is in your heart. It's in your heart. So if you're a murderer, it's in your heart. You're thinking evil about people, against people, it's in your heart. You're an adulterer, you're a fornicator, you're a thief, you lie. Well, that's what a false witness is. Guess what? It's in your heart. That's, what, that's where it's at. He said that's what defiles somebody. You cannot be defiled by washing of hands or the lack of. So, no, that does not mean, if it's a young person watching me right now, that does not mean you can go home and tell mama, oh, Pastor Seal say, if I don't wash my hands, I'm all right. No, don't get beat up, because that ain't what Pastor Seal said. I'm just telling you what God's word says. And God's word says that not washing your hands is not, is not going to cause you to be defiled. That's not it. What causes you to be defiled is what you let come out your mouth. Hello, somebody. You got to be careful what you let come out your mouth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepted in thy sight. My Lord, my strength, my redeemer. We've got to guard our heart that we're doing what Jesus has called us to do. Let's go on just a little bit further. I think I'm doing pretty good on time. Any questions from anybody on Facebook and YouTube? I'm looking at your comments. Thank you for commenting and interacting with me. Those of you who are not commenting, you're just getting it. Hey, I'm good with that too. Uh, but the reason uh, I have a tablet right here is because I'm, I'm looking at... Um, your comments and, and if there's any question, please ma'am, please sirs, at any time drop that question and I will do my best to answer it for you to the best of my ability. All right. Let's let's get on with it. Twenty-first verse. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold a woman of Canaan Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But when he answered her not a word, his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But when he answered and said, I'm sorry, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat, it's not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. 
and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Jesus is now a, a continuing to travel, and while he's traveling, he comes into a region, and a Canaanite woman comes and stops him. I want you to see the language in the text. I want you to see the language in the text. When she comes to Jesus, the first thing she does is she cries unto him with a loud voice, O Lord, thou son of David, stop. What's the big significance about that title? Understand biblically, Lord was a title you gave out of respect. Okay? I often joke about, I think it's, it's Sarah who called Abraham my Lord. So I often joke about, I, I tell Lady D, I have not gotten there yet until I can get you to call me my Lord. Ladies who's married, if you want to make your man happy for Father's Day, just, just go in there all Father's Day and say, how can I serve you, my Lord? <laughs> Ain't nobody saying nothing now. Okay, let's go a little further. But this is what makes the difference about what she says. Sister Joanne, I just read your comment. You're right. If I hit you, I didn't mean to miss you. That's what it come under. Lord, y'all listen to me, don't y'all? Uh, so catch this. She comes into the city and she says, O oh Lord, thou son of David. This makes a difference in what she said. If she just said, O oh Lord, my Lord, that is a title of respect. But she looks at him and say, O oh Lord, thou son of David. Simply put, I know who you are. I know you are God's chosen. I know you are the Messiah. I know who you are. I sense who you are. I may not be a, a Christian believer because of where I come from, but one thing I do know, I know who you are. Are y'all with me? She says, now listen what she says. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. I, got to, I need to rewind. She hollered unto him, have mercy on me. I, I can't miss that. Messiah, Lord, Savior. My daughter is vexed with the devil, but I need you to have mercy on me. What is very interesting to me is she asked the Lord to have mercy on her, but she ain't the one with the devil. She's not the one with the problem, but here is she coming on proxy or on the behalf of her child. That's not the only person who came to the Lord on the behalf of their child. The Bible says in the book of Job, when Job was sacrificing unto God, he sacrificed for his children because he said it just might be that they curse God in their hearts. So his sacrifice, his offering to God was on the behalf of his children because he didn't know what his children's spiritual status was. But this woman comes to the Lord and said, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. I want you to do this thing for me because I know who you are. My daughter is not in a place to come to you for herself because she's vexed with the devil. Have mercy on me. Sometimes God will use you to be the intercessor for your children. The songwriter said, somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took a little time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. Sometimes God will use you to be an intercessor for your children. I'm here because I had a praying mama, or I have, excuse me, I have a praying mama. I'm here because somebody prayed for me. Somebody had, a, had enough God sense to say, that boy need Jesus. Hello, somebody. I know I ain't the only one today who can thank God that somebody prayed for you. Somebody interceded for you. Somebody believed God for you. And so in our text, she intercedes for her daughter and she asks the Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is vexed with the devil, but here is the upsetting. Here is the, the disturbing, <coughs> excuse me, the disturbing thing that happens. 
she asked the Lord to have mercy and the Lord says nothing. <laughs> the Lord says nothing. Verse 23 says, but he answered her not a word. Can you imagine being in the master's face? I want you to see this. Can you imagine being in his presence? Y'all face to face. You're right in front of him and you ask him to have mercy. And he don't say a word. He doesn't open up his mouth to say anything. I'm asking for mercy. And you say nothing. Have you ever been there when you prayed and you ain't hear nothing? He didn't say a word. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You stand, stand still. Having done all the stand, stand, stand fast in that liberty. He doesn't answer her a word. But then his disciples open up their mouth. And I want you to see this verse number 23. The disciples open up their mouth and say, send her away for she crieth after us. She wasn't crying for us. She was crying after Jesus, the one who could change her situation, the one who can fix whatever her daughter was going through and deliver her out of the clutches of the hand of the enemy. She wasn't crying for the disciples. She was crying for Jesus. Sin her away. She's crying after us. Let me help you out, my brothers and my sisters. I know sometimes when we get in church, there's some people who feel like they have to holler and scream and cry. Some people feel like they got to run and jump and give God the glory. You do whatever you have to do. I don't care how many people it upset. I don't care how many people it disturb and bother them because you got to cry out, because you have to praise them, because you have to give them glory. You ain't doing it for them. They don't have a heaven hell to put you in and the disciples I got some news to tell you she wasn't crying after y'all she was crying after Jesus I've got to get in contact with my Lord and my Savior that's who I'm crying after blind Bartimaeus he was hollering for Jesus they said hush don't hush that noise. You, you disrupting everything. Be quiet. You, you bothering the master. The Bible said he cried even louder. You cry until you get God's attention. Holler until he hears you. Oh, bless his holy name. I don't care who it bothers. I don't care who it disrupts. I don't care who it, it gets on whose nerves. You cry out to God. She was not talking to the disciples. She was talking to the Lord. But guess what her cry got her? Look at verse number 24. Her cry got her a response. Might not have been the response she wanted, but it made, her, it made God talk to her. Glory to God. Come on here. He says in verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, baby, I, I, this, I, I came for Israel. That, that's my job. That's my assignment. Oh, but she knew there was one thing that God couldn't stand. God could not stand a, a praise that he wouldn't come and hear about it. He couldn't stand somebody lifting him up and he didn't come see about him. Look at what she did in verse number 25. The Bible says, then she came and she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. Watch this. She petitioned the Lord standing up, but she realized standing up wasn't getting the job done. So what did she do? She laid down and worshiped him. If you can't get it fixed standing up, you can show get it fixed on your knees. Sometimes you have to change your position. Sometimes you have to change your outlook so you can have a great outcome. She started worshiping him. This man, first of all, didn't answer you. Second of all, he told you he wasn't sent for you, and then you started worshiping him. I come to tell you, my brothers and my sisters, there are some times you can call on the Lord, and it seemed like he ain't come through yet. I dare you to start worshiping him. He will show up. How you know? Because he inhabits. He lives in the very praises of his people. If it seemed like he ain't answering you now, I dare you to worship him. I dare you to give 
give him some glory. I dare to, to, to thank him like it's already done. This morning when I got up, I didn't ask the Lord for nothing. The Lord shook me four o'clock this morning, woke me out of my sleep. And when I got up out of my sleep four o'clock this morning, I started interceding for my family. I started interceding for my church family. I started interceding for my, for my city, my state, and my country. Before I know it, I dozed back off to sleep. But when I woke up again this morning, around 745, I just woke up saying, God, I thank you. I thank you. Everything may not be like I want it to be, but I still thank you. I thank you for being God. I thank you for being my keeper. I thank you for being my deliverer. I thank you for being my sustainer. I thank you for being my comforter. I thank you for being my guide. I thank you for being my rock. I thank you for being everything that I need you to be. We got to learn. Hallelujah to God. We got to learn how to give God the glory. God answers her, I'm not sent for you, but then she started worshiping. Oh, he turned around and said, listen, baby, listen, I really, I really want to bless you, but you understand my culture looks at your culture a little bit different. My culture looks at your culture like you are a bunch of dogs. And he says it is not lawful to give the children's bread to dogs. Oh, glory to God. But she turns around and answers the Lord. She says, yeah, you absolutely right. But can I tell you what the dogs do? The dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, your children are some sloppy eaters. Your children don't realize how, how blessed they are and so they pick and choose what they want to eat but those of us that are dogs we eat whatever we can get our hand on that comes from God that comes from you our Lord so yes I might be a dog but I'm still eating at your table and so whatever you can throw me oh come on here if you can throw me some leftover healing that's enough to get my child healed if you can throw me some leftover deliverance that's enough to get my child delivered I don't need to be seen I just need the, uh, the effects and the results that you can bring. He says it's not lawful to give the children's bread to dogs. She says it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Let me tell you something. We're living in a culture that sees us less than human. And I'm talking about African American. I'm talking about our Spanish speaking brothers and sisters and those from foreign country. There are some in this country that sees us less than humans. But catch what? You can see me less than what you want to see me. I still got a God on my side that when people won't help me, God will see about me. When people put me down, God will bring me up. When people forget about me, God will remember me. When people allow me, God will give me his truth. Come on here, somebody. When people steal from me, God give me double for my trouble even though she was looked upon as a dog she said guess what Lord you want to call me a dog I'll take that but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table and I'm willing to eat everything you have to give me well let's look at verse number 28 the Bible says then Jesus answered and said unto her O woman great is thy faith be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole that very same hour. Her faith got her results. She did not get offended. It pushed her to believe God more. You know what hinders a lot of us when it comes to the things of God? We are so easily offended. We're easily offended when people don't do what we want them to do, when people don't say what we want them to say, or when people don't maneuver how we want them to maneuver. We become easily offended. This Can you imagine the Lord calling you? Now, you know it ain't right to give dogs what belong to the children. You mean to tell me somebody call you a dog and you won't have no problem? She said, you call me whatever you want to call me. I'm not here to be recognized as anything. I'm here to get some results. Watch this. Her worship, her persistence, her faith. I need to rewind that. Her discernment, because she knew who Jesus was. 
her discernment, her persistence, her worship, her faith got her results. Are y'all with me? Man, my time is about up. Her discernment, she knew who the Lord was. She knew who he was. Persistence. She kept worship. She kept on. She worshiped it. She worshiped it and she kept being persistent. But most of all, she had faith. And that faith pr produced the results. She needed. Y'all, I only have a few more verses left in this 15 chapter. I tell you what, we'll pick it up uh, on next week. Um, I think I got 10 more verses uh, in this particular chapter. And in those 10 verses is two different situations. And so I don't want to rush to get that done. So can we pick that up next week? Are y'all good with that? Can we pick it up next week? I, I want to pick that up on, on, on next week. Um, I want you to join us. I want you to join us, if you will. Uh, join us on this coming Saturday. That's right, this coming Saturday, uh, we're honoring our young people uh, with our education drive in service and I'm, I'm telling you um, the um, staff of, of people that we have here that's working to give these young people an awesome drive in education service is some phenomenal people uh, and I want you to come and help us as we um, honor our young people um, for uh, Education Day. This coming Saturday at 11 a.m. It's on your screen uh, right here at Connors Temple. We're going to honor our young people for their job well done in school. Brother Rollington, thank you so very much. That's it, Elder Walker. Discernment, persistent worship, and faith will produce results. Uh, so this Saturday, I hope y'all will come and, and worship with us. Um, not worship, you know, when you're churchy, you're just churchy. But this Saturday, I hope you will come and honor the Lord with us as we recognize our young people for their job well done and their great accomplishments. Hey, y'all, this is going to be on repeat tonight. I'm not going to teach this lesson again tonight. This is going to be on repeat again tonight. So I, I, if you missed something today, I dated tonight at 7, have your pencil and your paper and I, I want you to be ready to, to write down notes. The 15th chapter of the book of Matthew, oh man, there's so much wonderful stuff in there that I know would be a blessing on to you. I'm trying to think of anything that I need to remember. I always want you to come and worship the Lord with us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Every Sunday at 10 a.m. Sister Walker, God bless you so much. Every Sunday at 10 a.m. is our worship experience. Um, and the Lord said the same, we'll be on the parking lot across the street for our drive-in service. If not, like we was on last Sunday, we rushed into the church and we got the live together. And uh, just thank God for all of you who share with us. Go back and, and repeat this, get you some good notes. Again, this is being replay at 7 o'clock. If I can get it to replay, if I can't, then I'll be back live at 7 o'clock. Uh, Sister Vernita Williams, bless you. Did I say that right, Vernita? Yeah, I think I said that right. Uh, so God bless all of you. Hey, have a wonderful and blessed day. And uh, we hope to see you Sunday morning. Bye-bye.